Hi, everybody. Uh, rapid transition uh, to a new panel and an exciting new topic. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Alex Thier, and I'm the executive director at the Overseas Development Institute. And for this panel, I actually don't know what number we are now because I know we've moved around, um, but it's one of the most exciting, one of the four most exciting panels of the day, I can assure you. <laughs> um, uh, um, it, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, and I will just start by saying that uh, I think I, like many others, uh, am here for a number of reasons, but principally uh, because Martin Barber um, uh, hired a, a scraggly young man to go into Afghanistan uh, many, many years ago to work on humanitarian assistance uh, for him. Um, and uh, 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 I don't know if I've achieved uh, that, that uh, height ever since, but uh, it's been a real honor to know Martin and, of course, many of the others who have uh, put this together. Um, and I, you know, I think we are obviously here at an interesting moment, um, and our panel um, is a, a fascinating group who uh, have been working on the issues of famine and food security for a long time. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Um, I'm gonna say something, and then I'm gonna turn over to our first panelist. Uh, you've got this great booklet, uh, so I won't go into uh, bios in detail. Uh, but immediately here to my left is Josette Chiron, who's the president of the Asia Society um, and the former executive director of the World Food Program. Um, and I understand has some props to share along with some insights. Um, next to her is Louis Sita, um, who is at IDS at Sussex University um, and is responsible uh, together with Saba uh, who I will mention in a minute for starting up the new Humanitarian Leadership Academy. Um, on the far right over here is Saba al Mubasalat. Close? Mubasalat? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, who um, is at also at the Humanitarian Leadership Academy and coming quite recently from direct experience on the ground in places like Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, um, and Rob Bailey who is at home and yeah. only had to walk downstairs, who is at Chatham House um, and has been working uh, on these issues for some time. Um, you know, going back and looking at the report and, and particularly uh, this report, Famine, a Man-Made Disaster, which I understood uh, was revealed this morning, may have been written by Mr. Malik Brown. Um, it's a fascinating and disturbing read, uh, not only as a reminder of what was going on at the time, uh, but also, uh, about how many familiar things crop up when you read that report. Um, and it simultaneously reminded me, as I think much of the conversation has today, um, how much has changed and how much has stayed the same. Uh, we are in a world uh, in which uh, the recognition of famine being uh, a man-made phenomenon uh, now reads like conventional wisdom uh, but it wasn't at the time. Um, a lot of interesting work, including that of Amartya Sen and others, um, has gone on to deepen our understanding of that phenomenon that was detailed in the report. Um, but fundamentally, um, we are left with the same sad conclusion, which is if we didn't know it then, we certainly know it now. Um, and that gives us no better excuse uh, for the tolerance of famine. Uh, the second thing, obviously, that follows from that, perhaps most devastatingly of all, is that famine is still with us. Uh, we have spent uh, the last two years plus talking about the reemergence of famine uh, uh, in up to four different places at the same time. Uh, we have talked about uh, the reversal of the trend um, in the World Food Security Report uh, that more people are now going hungry uh, then previous years, uh, a devastating reversal of a long-term trend. Um, we also know, however, that some things have gotten better. Um, there are tools, technology. Um, when you look at some of the discussion of early warning in that report almost 30 years ago, it really does seem like quite a different era um, in terms of what's going on uh, today. Um, and fundamentally, we are still left with the question mark about uh, successfully feeding the planet. Although some of the analyses of the global macroeconomic situation, terms of trade and all of that, 
sound a little bit outdated from the 30 years ago report, um, it's hard to walk into any discussion today that doesn't uh, highlight the fact that we are looking at 9 billion people, a roughly 40 to 50 percent need in global food production, um, uh, rising appetites for different types of food around the world, um, and a lack of understanding still about how we're going to get there. Um, so with that scene setter, uh, let me welcome uh, Josette to start off the conversation about some of your reflections on what that report told us and where we've gotten to. Well, thank you. I, I was picking up the report because Mark has this incredible capacity to bring both poetry and prophecy. So each chapter here starts with some quote going back as far as centuries BC to today and to poets of our time uh, in framing food security. One thing that struck me in reading the report, I actually, when I was first invited to this, I just picked this up on a plane and was reading it, and I didn't realize it was over 30 years old. And I thought, oh, this is so relevant. Oh my God, the world has to know this. And then I started thinking, why is it only quoting things from like 30 years ago? And then I looked and I thought, oh my gosh, this is you know, a very old report, but extremely relevant to today. And I'd like to talk about a few of those issues. One thing that I, I always keep in mind is that the pursuit of human history has really been one of the pursuit of food security. If you read Guns, Germs, and Steel, it's really about humanity searching for food security. And it's only really in modern times that we flip to the prevention of famine, right? Because this was more the state of humankind throughout history. And you go back to the Roman Empire or biblical times and these stories of you know, starvation and seeking food security. And I remember for me, my awakening moment on this issue was in 1987 and I held my first child in my arms and I was watching TV and the famine from Ethiopia came forward and there was a mother trying to nurse her child who was crying and she had no ability to have any milk and the baby expired right there in the news report. And I remember thinking there's nothing more haunting than the cry of a child whose parent, whose mother cannot meet that cry. But what outraged me, if we want some outrage at this conference, is for the first time in human history, we actually know how to solve this problem. And we were in a food surplus world. We couldn't always say that in human history, but today we continue to be in a food surplus world. So whatever isn't working in the system so that we have the worst of horrors that we can imagine, that parents cannot take care of their children, cannot provide that food. I want to say for the record, I've met thousands of hungry or starving people everywhere from Darfur to Somalia to you know, Afghanistan, everywhere. I have never met a hungry person who wants to be dependent on an external force to feed their family. And I just want to say that because the attitudes that you, you get met with when you're trying to represent the world's hungry people is similar to the Famine Museum in Ireland, which the big quote up there is, if these people weren't so lazy, they wouldn't be hungry. And that persists today. And you know, so often in my travels, people will say, well, don't give a man a fish, teach him how to fish. And I always try to articulate the places I've been, there is no pond to fish in, there is no string to drop in the pond, even if there was one, and there is no fishing pole most often. But I have seen farmers and poor people all over the world innovate in ways we can't even imagine to scratch out a little bit of food for their family in the most difficult of circumstances. So in you know, efforts to keep the debate to the enabling environment for people to care for themselves, to me this is always the question. What has gone wrong here that people cannot take care of their own family, cannot provide for them, cannot feed themselves, and try to unknot that problem? Certainly a huge proportion of what we face today is man-made, and one of the um, kind of critical uh, insights of the report, I think, was saying that drought and other crises exposed the weaknesses of the human systems, of local governance, of food security systems, of farming systems, 
and there is no resiliency in many of the places where they get hardest hit and there isn't the capacity to handle this. Um, and I will say that this became most sharply cl uh, clear in almost an epic way in 2008 during the food crisis when the price of food doubled virtually overnight in six months. The world had never seen or recorded such an acceleration in prices. I was head of the World Food Program and we were literally sitting there in a room with maps of where we were reaching people. WFP delivers about 30 billion meals a year into war zones and disaster zones. And we were literally saying, well, if we move this food, because 140 million people were thrown into urgent hunger with that doubling of food prices, if we move you know, half the rations from people in Darfur, could they survive for six weeks with half as much food? Well, what about these children? You know, they haven't been hungry. And I thought at one point, this is insane. This is insanity. We're literally triaging the world here, and we have to put out a bigger cry to the world. And one thing I began to pursue is this fact that most countries on Earth, particularly the developing world countries, and at that time China even, did not have adequate resiliency systems when things go wrong. So in 2008, we had, for the first time that places like Cargill can remember, whole nations unable to place a food order to feed their populations, to bring in food, not just humanitarian food, but regular food. Liberia could not place an order on food markets. And in looking at it, they had about three weeks of food reserves in Liberia, period. And it's an importing nation. Philippines, the same thing. Afghanistan ran out of food could not place an order for food on global food markets. So one thing we had put forward in the G20 in Paris, I think 2010, I don't remember, were two ideas. One is this idea of cooperative food reserves in different regions of the world because most nations can't afford that. But what do they do? I mean, what do you do when you run out of food? What do you do when food supplies get short? Not the total supplies, but just like the cases in Bangladesh here, nations begin to hoard and people begin to hoard and all those export barriers went up in over 35 countries overnight. You can't buy food, so you have to have some ability to buy a little bit of time. How do we do that? And um, looking at those kind of bigger factors that could add to the resiliency that's so identified in this report. Um, a couple of things I wanted to touch more deeply on. Um, one is this quote from the report, famine also changes the demographic map, it makes people move. And I just want to say one of my things I tried to stress for the world as head of the World Food Program is when people face starvation, they have three choices. They can revolt, they can migrate, or they can die. That's it. And in Syria, when we saw the massive movement of refugees, Antonio Guterres, who's now the Secretary General of the UN, who was then head of UNHCR, timed that to the press release that WFP put out saying they were gonna cut food rations dramatically. We know all over the world at WFP, the minute we have to announce that rations are being cut, people will move. They panic. And in this case, the food for the refugees so generously hosted by Jordan and other countries was funded at 16%. The gap was something like 125 million for that period. The cost of that mass movement, massive. And so our investment in the tools to help stabilize populations on the move and to meet the immediate food needs and the stability of that system is not adequate to the task we have and the price and the cause of crises because of that is quite dramatic. Um, much more to say on that, but I just wanna talk about a few uh, innovations and people like Mark know I love show and tell, it was my favorite part of school. So I just wanna give a little hope and say innovation in food is happening at a macro level, it's happening at a scientific level, and it's happening down at the village level. 
And all of these are really important to the fact that we have to produce twice as much food in the next 40 years than we've been producing now if we're going to keep up with population growth. So I just want to show a few of these. So first of all, when I was at the World Food Program, we realized that people in hungry places in the world do not have the options that many of us have to go into a grocery store and get a power bar. Do you want vitamin C? Do you want vitamin D? How much protein do you want? What do you want? There aren't those kind of tools. And then particularly when you go into a crisis, such as in Myanmar or in Gaza or anywhere else, there isn't a power-packed nutritional thing that you can deliver, in particular for very young children. So we developed this thing called Wawa Mom with scientists in Pakistan and India, and it's chickpeas with every micronutrient needed to protect a child's brain, and it costs about 17 cents, and this package doesn't have to be refrigerated. You don't have to add water. You squeeze it in a kid's mouth. It tastes great, like sweet hummus. You can drop it out of helicopters. You can throw it into war zones, which we did in Somalia. Literally a game changer, like this little pack of oral rehydration salts, which became a game changer for people facing cholera. Again, sugar, salty water, but literally changes lives. So these kind of interventions that allow people to access safe food that's very nutritional is very powerful. Um, I still attract a lot of young people's favorite part of doing the kind of work I do who want to change the world. And this young guy comes to me from a university in Canada, 21 years old, and he said, I want to end global anemia. He said, this is killing women and children and this malnutrition. I said, oh, that's wonderful, kind of patting him on the head, and, you know, that's great. And the UN iron supply system that you, you send out to help women in areas where they're suffering from this is about $90 a year, but the supply chain is a nightmare. And anyway, can people take it? Do they have the water to take it? Well, he had decided in Cambodia to try something from pre-World War II, where in the US and Europe, people were cooking in iron pans and there was no anemia crisis. So he thought, maybe you put a hockey puck made of iron into a rice pot and it will leak enough. Well, it did. So he went to Cambodia and he met almost complete rejection of his hockey puck. So he realized, you know, my God, I don't understand this market because it costs $5 for the hockey puck. It lasts five years. It can give the exact amount of iron to a family. And so he went back and studied the culture and to the point of local solutions, he found out that the fish is the lucky symbol. So he invented the lucky iron fish, which is my favorite new innovation. <laughs> Throw it in a rice pot. It will keep a family of five out of the anemia zone four or five years. And when the smile disappears, you have to do a new one. It's made by local women. It's distributed by local women. And places like Hilton Hotels now offer it. You, when you check out, you can buy one for a family. But these kind of innovations that get down to the base level of the challenge. Don't shoot above it with really fancy technologies. The last thing I'll say is food aid. When I was at WFP, we shifted almost completely to cash food aid gifts to WFP rather than commodity aid. But then often it was still commodity aid or almost 100% of the time to recipients. And the big criticism of food aid, right, destroying local markets because the big insight in this report is you can have starvation in the face of food being in the markets. And it's not about there not being food, it's about people not being able to afford the food for whatever reason. And in Bangladesh it was people lost their day jobs, same thing in Myanmar. Today, um, about 25% of food aid will be delivered over cell phones and by little cards like this and can be redeemed in local markets, thereby creating instead of destroying the local engines of food economies. A long story there, but I'll just say when I called the youngest people at WFP together and I said there must be something better than delivering commodities everywhere, and they said, oh, just deliver food on a cell phone. I said, you know, I'm, I consider myself tech savvy. I don't understand how food pops out of a cell phone. But we figured that out, and uh, that's a revolution. The last thing I'll just say is issues like, I was just at West Point uh, listening to their leadership program for other reasons. 
and they said um, any institution is only as good as what it allows to happen in its presence. And I think the world is only as good as what we allow to happen in our presence. And today we have so many children that go to school so hungry they can't lift their heads off a desk. And I had followed one man, George McGovern, a senator in the US, whose dream was that every kid in school have a cup of food. And this cost about 10 cents for a cup of nutritious food. And so I priced it out, and just so we know, for the world to say that no child on earth goes to school hungry would cost about $1.4 billion a year. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's 10% of the Christmas bonuses on Wall Street. So it might not be that much. <laughs> but just so we know when things seem out of our reach, they're actually amazingly within our reach if we put our mind to it. And I think that's the story of hunger in our times. <laughs> so, Rob, um, one of the questions that comes up in a report like this is, did we know? Did we know the famine was coming? Did we know that it was going on? Um, in the intervening 30 years, there's a quaint reference in here to looking more at satellite imagery. Um, today, you could call up high-resolution imagery of any place on Earth quite easily. Um, the proliferation of communications make it so that there could really be no hidden hunger virtually maybe with one or two exceptions, um, and yet it persists. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I, uh, I think there's huge potential for continued development in famine early warning systems and making the whole issue of global hunger more transparent. So we're starting now, we have been seeing now uh, the huge developments that have been made with satellite imaging um, I think big data and mobile telephony and essentially crowdsourcing early warning information is going to be a big opportunity in the future. I think when we looked at the 2011 Somalia famine, I think it was something like about 30% of people arriving in the camps in Ethiopia are actually carrying mobile phones, right? So if you can start to find a way to tap into the information that's going to be in that chatter, then you've got another source of early warning information there. I think... Um, that we have to be cautious, though, in being uh, overly optimistic about, about the potential of ever improving famine early warning information. Uh, if you look at the broad history of famines over the last sort of 150 years or so, you, what you see is that in the vast majority of them, probably about 90% of them, government has its fingerprints in some way or another, whether it's through acts of uh, omission you know, disengagement, letting a famine happen when something else could have been done, or in, in other cases, acts of what could be considered acts of commission taking actions which knowingly will make a famine worse or cause one. And so I think it, given that these famines are essentially very often politically created, it would be naive to suppose that just by having better information, um, governments will act upon that information to prevent famines. And I'll just give you a, a couple of examples from recent history after the, the, the publication of the report. The first one um, I want to talk about is Niger. So I, when I was with Oxfam, I spent some time working in West Africa on, on the food crises that were happening there in the early 2000s. And uh, in Niger in 2005, things with Mamadou Tanja, the president there, things actually reached a, a somewhat farcical level looking back on it now. But there, of course, at the time, there was a huge amount of reluctance on the part of the government to even acknowledge that hunger was an issue in the country, let alone that famine was a possibility. And so you had these crazy situations, these stories of Mamadou Tanja's motorcade going through Niger with hapless officials in cars a couple of miles up the road removing signs for action contre la femme because there was no hunger in Niger. You couldn't talk about hunger happening. And of course, in 2005, things got beyond farcical into the kind of the pernicious where the BBC was kicked out of the country for reporting on the, on the food crisis there and WFP was threatened with having its offices shut down. So all this goes to show that actually early warning information about a famine or a food crisis can be intensely threatening to political incumbents. And anybody that's worked in Ethiopia will know there that the food assessment needs numbers 
are negotiated. They're negotiated with the government. Okay, and so we get this situation where there's a period of negotiation, there's a period of delay, there's a period of prevarication. The number is always lower than they need to be in the first instance, and we end up with not enough food aid, not enough supply lines. And this is actually something I think is, is probably something of an issue now in, in the Somali region in Ethiopia. It's not just, of course, national governments that can choose to treat famine early warning information as they so choose. It's donor governments can turn a blind eye to it as well when it suits them. So if you look at two closely related food crises in Ethiopia, one in 2003, uh, where there was a very slow response to the famine and early warning information, and then another one two years later in 2005, when the donor community mobilized incredibly rapidly. What had, sorry, it's not, it's 2000, 2003, not 2003, 2005. What had happened in the intervening period? September the 11th and the global war on terror, and Ethiopia had become uh, a bulwark in, in the, the global war on terror in the Horn of Africa. And it was incredibly important for Western donors, in particular the US, to make sure that there wasn't a food crisis or a famine in Ethiopia and risking regime change there. So the politics shifted completely. I guess the most notorious example in, in recent years is the 2011 famine in Somalia, which probably has the dubious honor of being the best documented descent into mass starvation in history. And in the period from November to July, in the dec when the famine declaration happened, Fusnet and FSNAU, the, the, the Food Security <coughs> Nutrition Analysis Unit, uh, between them produced something like 80 bulletins over that period of escalating urgency. And yet, the funding remains completely flat, and there are political reasons essentially for why that was the case, in particular relating to the Patriot Act in the US and concerns about food aid being appropriated by al-Shabaab in South Central Somalia. So it re resulted in a kind of paralysis. So you can have the best early warning information that you want, but unless the politics are aligned with taking action to prevent and mitigate famine, there's no reason to suppose that it's going to happen. So again, it all comes back to politics at the end of the day. I'll finish on a positive note, though, because I, I'm, I realize after Josette's presentation, <laughs> I'm kind of taking us back down into the <laughs> into depths. But um, Somalia 2017. It could have happened. It really could have happened, and it didn't. And it's not to say that we're out of the woods yet. Uh, there's a f potentially a fourth period of failed rains upon us now, and extremely bad structural food insecurity in the country. But it looks like the famine was prevented, and that was because there was a better donor response. There was uh, a government there. There was a president who stood up and asked for help, and it was because donors did what was necessary. So it can work um, when, again, when the politics are right. Mm. Thanks. Um, Lewis, I'm going to come to you next. So we've heard about some exciting advances uh, on both, on, on all sides, including early warning, but this fundamental warning that politics remains um, at the heart. Um, if you were uh, Mark Malik Brown sitting down at your Selectric typewriter, with, with it, <laughs> something like that, uh, and writing some of the lessons learned from, from recent experiences um, where we have the benefit of this knowledge, the benefit of these changes, um, a world that over the last couple of years has been seized with questions of is the system fit for purpose? So what would you have to say about some of the lessons learned from recent cases that you've been working on? So um, thanks, Alex. And here's one I prepared earlier. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in fact, just read out the title. For yeah. It, so, sorry, um, we left some copies at the beginning. In fact, it says "Famine Lessons Learned," uh, mm. and I was lucky enough to collaborate with Stephen Devro on this, who many of you will know is a great expert and writer on famine over the years at Institute of Development Studies, where I'm working at the moment. Um, I mean, it's 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 interesting to ask the ask the question in the context of of Mark's work and the panel. And, and, and the report. And we've heard a lot, I think, in the previous sessions about how, how nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in terms of compliance with international humanitarian law. Nothing has changed in terms of migration. I mean, everything has changed and, 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 and nothing has changed. I think 
when it comes to famine, um, you know, as both Josette and, um, um, and Rob have said, actually, there is some pretty positive news. Um, one of the reasons why we felt it necessary to, to write the Lessons Learned paper is that actually, apart from, you know, with the great exception of Somalia in 2011, there haven't been that many famines in the intervening period, to the point where, before Somalia 2011, you, some of our famine expert colleagues were talking about how we'd, how we'd cracked it. So, rather dispiritingly, we now find ourselves going backwards, uh, having made quite a lot of progress in the intervening times. So, I mean, broadly, I'd say, in terms of those lessons, um, a, a, a lot has been learned over the intervening period. And a lot of those, uh, some of those just touched on some of those that Rob touched on. But I would broadly say they're technical. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress technically in the field of combating famine. We've made much progress in terms of early warning systems. Uh, the integrated phase classification that FAO uses today is much better than previous iterations, and they were much better than when Mark wrote the report. Um, unfortunately, of course, early action is another thing altogether. Uh, we've made tremendous strides in terms of relief logistics and the competency of organizations like World Food Programme to deliver into very difficult places in very timely fashion at, at scale. Um, we've made tremendous advances in terms of nutritional um, competence, so the revolution of ready-to-use therapeutic food in the mid-2000s, whereby now you can give kids plumpy nut and they can go home, and that means that they don't have to stay in a feeding center for a month. Um, even, even cash that Josette touched on, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Mark Bowden across the room, who was the humanitarian coordinator in Somalia during the famine in 2011, and, and, and UNICEF put $100 million worth of cash into, into Somalia, when World Food Prog Program couldn't get in there and Mark went to Dubai to negotiate with merchants so that they would bring food in. Um, so we've made tremendous progress in terms of prevention, one of the things that Mark calls for. Um, Stephen Devereux, again, who, who I had the honor to work with, wrote this seminal destitution study in Ethiopia in the 80s that then led to the Productive Safety Net Program that now gives people food and cash ahead of time to stop them falling off the edge, to stop them falling into famine in Ethiopia. And with all of the things that I completely accept that Rob has said about still the politically negotiated process and the perilousness that, that, that we face in Ethiopia, largely, touch wood, fingers crossed, we have prevented famine in Ethiopia in the intervening period. Um, where we have made no progress and where we risk slipping backwards is politically. And I, I think, you know, is... Is famine a man-made disaster? <coughs> Absolutely, uncontrovertibly today. If we look at Yemen, if we look at South Sudan, these are acts of commission, in Rob's words. Uh, we have half of the population in Yemen today in IPC phase class classification three and four. That means that they're at risk of famine as we speak. And yet, uh, the port of Hodeida is being blockaded WFP is not allowed to put heavy lifting cranes to bring food at scale into Yemen, even though 2,000 people have died of cholera as we speak. In South Sudan, exactly the same situation. Half of the population uh, at risk of famine, three and four, 20,000 people in phase five, which means that they're starving to death. Again, directly attributable to the action of the belligerents. It, famine is being used as a weapon of war today in Yemen, in South Sudan. In Nigeria and Somalia, perhaps we can say they're more acts of omission rather than commission. Neglect in the case of Nigeria and the oil-rich Nigerian government, okay, complicated by the conflict of Boko Haram as well. Um, the fragility of Somalia recovering from the 2011 famine um, uh, plunged back into you know, a near-miss situation because of drought, because of fragility, because of economics. And here's you know, the thought where I'll, that I'll leave you with, and I'm afraid it's not an uplifting thought, <laughs> Raman just said. Um, but there are acts of omission not just on the part of the belligerents who are using famine as a weapon of war or who are not protecting the populations that they govern, um, but acts of omission on the part of us, the international community, who despite the fact that a quarter of a million people died in Somalia as recently as 2011, 
we have only half funded the UN appeal in 2017. That's one and a half billion dollars worth of emergency assistance that the United Nations has asked for to feed an entire country or half of the country. And we've made $880 million worth of contributions today. Um, the UK, last thing, the UK alone throws away 23 billion pounds worth of food every year. Households throw away 13 billion pounds worth of food and the retail and commercial sector accounts for the other 10 billion. If we could capture that 23 billion pounds worth of food that we throw away every year, that would, that would hit all of Mr. Lowcock's emergency appeal globally. So, Sava. What, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we all like to think that we have learned from the experiences of the past that we've updated our practices and our approaches. Mm -hmm. um, you've come from some pretty hard environments dealing directly with these issues in the last couple of years. Um, uh, and when we were communicating before, you, you raised some concerns I want to make sure that we get to about the ways in which we still haven't updated uh, the mechanisms of our response to be yeah. the best that we can be. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, being the last speaker in almost the last session is quite interesting because all the smart things were said. <laughs> but I would just like to reflect on a um, few things that Lewis said before answering your question. Since the early morning, I've been hearing a lot of we. And you know, being from the global south, I usually struggle with the we because I don't know how inclusive it is and whether it includes you know, people who we refer to as affected population and whether it learns from them and it acknowledges their indigenous knowledge. When we talk about reports, researches, and you know, uh, developments in, in, in the sector of uh, learning. Um, the other thing that really worries me is that when we know, how much of that knowledge do we intentionally contextualize and make locally relevant and user-friendly and communicate in advance, proactively, before the fact? Because you know what? When you are in the middle of a response, it's really hard for you to learn. If you really are keen on taking that knowledge and the reports and the recommendations that were found three decades, four decades ago, and make sure that they translate into more resilient local communities. That kind of investment is part of the development. It needs to happen before the response. And we tend to always try to put our knowledge or go back to our archives and pull the last report on something or the last study or lesson learned on famine after famine starts, which is really, I struggle with as, as a frontliner myself. Back to your question, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question with a story. Um, I was a country director for an international organization um, for four years uh, during the Syria response based in Jordan, and we were responsible for the food security program in Zatari camp. Um, I do remember having to start our bread distribution every morning at 4.30 in the morning, um, where you distribute bread to 120,000, 180,000, 80,000, depending on the number in the camp of that day. And that varies between 10 to 13 tons of bread a day. The pipeline for that particular part of the program was secured for like one and a half to two months maximum. So we're always struggling with running out of money and not being able to distribute bread. When we suggested that, you know, instead of wasting all this money distributing bread, would people have to queue when it's 50 degrees Celsius and when it's on minus eight, why don't we just invest in a bakery and hire refugees where they go back into, you know, earning some income, having a sense of normalcy, going back to a routine, and just stop with the bread distribution? The answer that was given to us is it's not our mandate. And you know, and that's outrageous because you, you start questioning who puts those mandates, who, who, who writes those mandates, isn't it us? <coughs> but I tell you, as Lewis said, most of those decisions are politicized and sometimes manipulated to oppress and control the mass, who happen to be the most vulnerable and affected populations. So 
If you ask me, have we changed drastically our operations based on the great knowledge that we have gained in the past decade or two? I'd say no. Our ability to change the systems that we created is extremely slow if compared to our ability to learn and pretend that we're being innovative. So a challenge to all of us here, beyond the politics and the systems and the clusters and the UN and the INGOs and the South to North, whatever debate we're having, just remember that in a tent, in Zatari camp, in a very poor host community called Al Mafraq, which is the poorest governorate in Jordan, there are children um, who need to be saved. And it's not for us to save them. It's for themselves to save themselves. How can we invest up front of them? One thing I'll leave you with. All the population get, that ended up in Zatari camp, they came from um, an area in Syria or a region in Syria called Dara. And Dara is on the southern border of Syria. This was a completely ignored part of Syria by the regime before the war. But people survived the fact that they were ignored by the regime because they are resilient. So if we really want to change the way we look at things and do things, we have to acknowledge indigenous knowledge, appreciate people resilience, partner with them, and change the reality with them so that it is of sustainable impact beyond the band-aid that we distribute as part of our humanitarian system. Thank you. What you're articulating is one of the fundamental platforms to come out of the, the, the last couple of years of humanitarian summitry and the focus on, on localization. Is it happening? I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that we're, uh, like we had a chance, all of us, to go through the report, the, the commission and the recommendations. And the Humanitarian Leadership Academy was among the few very lucky organization that had someone like Martin Barber really volunteer to give us advice and mentor us um, as, as workers in the academy. And as much as I acknowledge the localization agenda that resulted of the Humanitarian Leader, um, uh, Summit, it's been there. It's in the recommendations. 30 years ago, investing in local actors was one of the key recommendations. What have we done? Why do we need to continue to invest loads of money on consultations, bringing people from all around the world to Istanbul to agree on what was agreed three decades ago? <laughs> so I think, you know, there is that. I think it's not about us being more able to operationalize the agenda. I think there's much more pressure from the oppressed mass mm -hmm. to make that agenda work. And we're left with two options, one of two options. We either evolve or we'll have to face a drastic revolution. So I think it's, it's smarter to decide to evolve and change together um, into a better world. Mm -hmm. So is it happening? It is, it'll take time, a few changes to the systems, but it has to happen. Great, we've got a little bit less than 15 minutes and we have more of a family than an audience here uh, who have worked on these things. So I invite <coughs> questions, comments, uh, and then we'll bring the panelists back in uh, to reflect on those. Does anybody want to speak? There's a right here gentleman in the middle. <coughs> Thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, presentation by the panel. Uh, I think uh, something is missing. Uh, you talked about uh, food distribution, uh, how to tackle famine, and so on. I think production side and investment was not covered in this, uh, in this panel. Uh, I'm from uh, Eritrea, uh, British Eritrea. I was in the famine in uh, Ethiopia in 74 that brought down Haile Selassie. In fact, uh, I was buying from a surplus area and uh, sending to a deficit area at the time. Uh, I, would, I also worked in Afghanistan. I was FAO representative. I retired now. And I saw about two famines. So famine is cyclical. It comes every, uh, every two to three years, be it in the Horn of Africa or, Afgan or Afghanistan, Somalia, wherever these drought-prone countries or uh, famine-affected countries, they are visited by famine every few years. Uh, 
Now, when the famine strikes, there is huge <coughs> fundraising uh, that goes to mitigate the famine. It's a good thing. Uh, to give you an example, in Afghanistan, uh, I, I don't remember the date exactly, maybe 2008 or so, uh, there was famine. Uh, WFP received about $500 million. Uh, UNDP's annual budget was about 1.2 billion, including it pays uh, the police force salaries. Uh, FAO rep received about 60 million, none from the, the uh, donations, but its annual budget or uh, donations that it receives from uh, donors, including World Bank for projects was about 60. So there is a big gap in investment. In order to mitigate the famine that happens every now and then, uh, production needs to be increased, for example, irrigation, uh, improvement of seeds, income generation activities, be it increasing okay. milk production, uh, poultry production, and so on. Thanks. These are lacking. Therefore, yeah. uh, we should not always focus on uh, yeah. the, the, the short term. Yeah. Activities, but investment Thank you. is like. I, I think, you. Uh, you know, almost remarkably, unless it slipped past me, we just had a discussion about food security and nobody said resilience, um, which is the agenda that has swept so much of the community. Somebody did say resilience. All right. I, I, I acknowledge that maybe it slipped <laughs> past me. Uh, uh, but um, obviously, um, the, the, the issue that the gentleman is raising is the, the classic dilemma of. Uh, trying to bridge the divide and making sure that the work that we're doing in advance is the thing that's going to forestall the next famine. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on this just, question. Yeah. yeah. If I could just say, I mean, the production part is huge and it's really, really important. And I think we're coming into the era where it's going to become even more important because the amount of food we produce, we've kind of reach diminishing returns as far as yields and capacity to get out of the land, what we've gotten. So all the expertise of FAO is going to have to be called on even in greater measure. One thing that, you know, if I had nothing to do in life, I would start something called Warehouses for Hope because part of what the problem is that I've observed is when farmers produce in the developing world, there's literally no place to safely store food and to keep it within villages to get through the rainy periods and all of this so that ability to build in resilience for those who are farming and their connection to markets. So it's that whole supply chain that we have to get better at and learn a lot about in addition to being able to get better yields where we go. I, I literally like worry about warehousing capacity. And in my TED talk on ending hunger, I in fact focus on how simple things like community food banking can revolutionize and get WFP out of business. My goal at WFP was to get us out of business, and in fact, every time a country got out of WFP's business, we brought the prime minister or president to celebrate in Rome. We had a celebration saying, you now run your own food security systems and production, and I think the goal of institutions like WFP should be to get out of business. Should I take others or any other comments? Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of people want to say, so in the middle, <coughs> Sarah, and the gentleman behind her. Thanks, Alex. I was, I was just trying to bring together the three panels we've had, um, you know, the general discussion the whole day, and, you know, everything we've discussed goes back to what holds us back, which is the politics. And, of course, we've got the politics with the big P, and that's harder for us to influence. Of course, we can try, we all do try, but there is a smaller you know, P politics, which is actually more pernicious and frustrating, and it is the politics of our own organizations. And that's the one we can influence and change, and we don't. And that's something that, for me, is critical for this community to think a lot more deeply and self-critically. Because we've heard it in the morning, we don't, you know, do enough demarches, we don't actually denounce violations enough, we could do a lot more to promote and, you know, um, defend IHL, and we don't. Um, the refugees, the discussion we had the refugees, uh, we tend to focus on a very you know, parochial agenda. We're focusing much more on assistance than rights. We're not promoting the rights of forcibly displaced. We're not you know, embracing the more holistic 
um, you know, proactive mandate that Martin was talking about, and the same with the discussion that we, you know, having now on food security and you know combating hunger. And Saba's very important point about how our mandates define, you know, what we do rather than what could really support people in that particular situation. And ultimately, it goes back to how we defend and protect our, the self-interest of our organizations. We continue to measure success on the basis of budgets, numbers, visibility. You know, we want to be seen as planting the flag, even if that flag doesn't go very deep. And it doesn't actually you know, demonstrate an added value for the people that you know, are in that particular crisis. And unless we really measure success in a different way and start thinking of, what exactly is going to help that particular group? And does it mean, you know, as you say, that we need to disappear to give space and support to you know, the, the local groups that can really respond, then we will continue to fail. And just behind you, uh, this gentleman. Thank you. Very, very briefly, I'd like to share a memory. In 1960, I think it was, at the Fifth International Congress of Nutrition, held in Washington, D.C., the um, keynote address was given by Lord Ritchie Calder, and he used a phrase that I have never forgotten. Democracy is a word that rumbles meaninglessly in empty bellies. Um, I'm just going to take the last two comments over here and then go back to the panel for a last minute. Ah, I didn't see you. Sorry. I will revise my prior statement. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, the, the woman in the second row, and then we'll end uh, with His Highness. Hi, thanks. Um, so I really wanted to bring the critique back to the early warning systems themselves. Of course, one of the main issues is um, political will, but I think there's still space to critique the early warning systems um, for the way that they've become quite depoliticized. And if we think that the main causal factor of famine today is um, politics, then it appears kind of strange to me that we don't have more of a kind of nuanced and insightful breakdown of the political economy causes of famines in the early warning systems themselves. And I'm aware that probably the main reason for this is because it would be very kind of controversial and it's a very politically sensitive thing to draw attention to. Um, but going back to what one of the gentlemen on the panel was saying um, about the example of Niger, um, clearly if governments are removing signs, bringing awareness to the fact there's a famine in their own country, there's still a lot of shame surrounding the issue of famine. It's implicitly part of the social contract between a government and its population. And I think that by including a more kind of systematic political economy analysis in the famine early warning systems, there might be space to start kind of reinstituting that contract between um, the government and its people. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Thank you. Mark, did you want to say, we'll ask Mark and then come back to you. I just wanted to uh, uh, echo slightly what Sarah was saying, but to elaborate on the point that Lewis made about, about famine. I mean, I think we, uh, in some ways, have gone backwards of fam on, on famine. And by that, I mean the concern that I have uh, is that uh, we no longer look at economic interventions. Uh, the, the real challenge facing humanitarianism, I think, is that it's become projectized and far too much projectized in its approaches to work. And that applies not just to famine, but also to displacement uh, and other issues. And I think it does reflect both the, the vested interests of uh, organizations and agencies, which I've seen as HC over a number of years, but also, I think, the new conflict environment that we're finding ourselves in where it's far safer to tie money up in small packages uh, than to look at the economic interventions. And I think that's partly uh, why we don't make any progress politically at the moment. Hmm. Uh, Mark, I'm not fast enough, but there's a great quote at the beginning of one of the chapters that says something to the effect of projects, projects everywhere, but only lacking a plan or something like that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Please, Excellency. I have a question which I think could be um, fitted into the last session, so I'll, I'll save it if I may. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, or, or otherwise, I, I would just read you the following from the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace, a Matter of Survival. And this is a question to the panel. I quote, water scarcity is exacerbated in a world with a growing population facing human-induced climate change. Humanity will have to find ways to produce 50% more food and double energy production by the middle of the century. The question is, would the panel, and for that matter, would this colloquium, favor joining forces with the uh, Global High Level Panel in a UN General Assembly convened full-fledged intergovernmental Global Conference on International Water Cooperation. So the nexus would be water, energy, food, and the human environment. Thanks. So quest, uh, an array of questions, comments, proposals, uh, and very little time. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to ask you each really just about a minute and a half, starting with you, Saab, and going down the line to respond to whatever you think is most uh, yeah. valuable. Maybe a few reflections. Um, projectile solutions to deep-rooted challenges do not work. Um, for that to, to, to stop happening, we have to you know, challenge ourselves. You know, we're so comfortable being the super international organizations where we manipulate the funds and we provide solutions to the poor, vulnerable, and misfortunate who live in the global south. That dynamic has to change. And the only way to change it is to become less financially dependent. You cannot be financially fully dependent, yet have a free will uh, to make your own independent decisions. So my message to the Global South all the time, wherever I go, start mobilizing resources at the local, national, and regional levels so that you have more space to make independent decisions. My second point and last is that things sometimes are much more difficult than they look to the likes of us who had the chance to you know, um, be educated and ex exposed and, and, and travel the world. In the absence of civil society, advocating for change at the grassroots level is near impossible. Sometimes when we go to Yemen or we go to Syria, we assume by default, because of our background, that there is such thing, there is civil society, and we start engaging. There's no civil society. So that, I mean, our, your starting point in certain places is different than what you used to here. So let's get into the mindset of people and walk their journey with them to change. It's not a change that we can bring from the outside. Thanks. I'll, I'll just take the question out. Early warnings in the interest of time. So I, it's a it's a great question. It's one I've I've wrestled with. Uh, somebody has to do the political economy analysis. Whether the best placed unit to do it is the early warning system, I think is open to question because. Uh, it will challenge the government in a lot of cases, and that may then result in the curtailment of the early warning systems access to information within that country. So if you look at the latest Fusnet note on Ethiopia, for example, the wording is very cautious. Um, they talk about delays in food aid and the possibility that certain households in the Somali region will find themselves on phase five. They don't mention the famine word, but the subtext, of course, is that there's a big problem here, and we could tip into famine unless there's a big scale up in food aid that was published at the end of September. And I suspect that if they had gone all out with a full political economy analysis of the negotiation of early warning data in Ethiopia, then they wouldn't be, uh, you know, they'd be persona non grata in Ethiopia pretty quickly. So I think that's that's the key issue. But just coming back, you know, it, 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 what it does, what all of this does for me is raise the question of government accountability in all of this. So if everybody in the room is kind of accepts the idea that governments in one way or the other are typically responsible for famines when they occur in, in the modern era, then why don't we have some kind of international system for holding governments to account when famines occur? An inquiry when a famine has happened where evidence is given and we can look at who was responsible, who did what well, who did what wrong, uh, and hold governments to account retrospectively. Just an idea. <laughs> um, 
I want to follow on this thought. And <coughs> one searing conclusion I came to after my service at WFP is famines and hunger do not happen when a head of state says, no child will die of hunger under my watch. When that happens, the world changes. I never worried about famine in Singapore, even though they produce no food. We knew it was a priority of the government. And when you see that change, the world can change. I've had heads of state appeal to me to feed their country when they're building their seventh palace. And I've had to say, why should the taxpayers of the world pay to feed your people if it's not your priority? This is a big issue. And frankly, at what point is it um, a real dereliction of public responsibility that gets called to account if governments don't do that? It gets to the water issue. SADAC has starvation after drought problem. I just checked recently, there's not one effective water agreement between the nations of SADC when all the main river arteries that flow through have to be managed under water agreements or else we're going to have the same cycle over and over and over again. Water agreements can literally save many, many lives as much as humanitarian action can. So I'd all be for that. And just the last thought, because it wasn't mentioned. In Somalia, when Mark was there and I was running WFP, I was told that if I would sign a paper guaranteeing Shabab would never get a drop of food, that I could get all the aid you know, needed to deal with that famine. <laughs> and a serious problem has emerged since the 80s, which is zero risk tolerance by parliaments and donor nations yeah. for humanitarian work. And I thought, we've got to flip this. So what we started doing at WFP, when we would never brief fully on risk, I said, you know those with prescription bottles, those long list of everything that could go wrong? I want to start our briefings with a full list of everything that can go wrong and say, now decide. Because I don't want the gotcha game of the picture of some terrorist with the thing of food, and then it's on the front page, and then the parliament gets upset. Humanitarian workers have no ability to control when your warehouse is attacked by terrorists, just like no, even militaries don't survive. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the risk framework. And I was told back in the 80s, in Afghanistan, there was an immediate write-off by donor governments of up to 50% of aid, thinking it's not going to survive, but at least we'll save 50% of the people. And I don't know how we deal with that, but that's mm. a huge issue for humanitarian workers. Mm. Lewis, final thoughts? Well, it's lovely to be in the position of coming <laughs> with the last word and uh, daunting because, of course, everybody says the, says the interesting points. I guess, so to pick up on Rob's point, Alex de Wall has out argued very powerfully to make mass starvation a, a crime against humanity. And I think that is part of the solution. If famines are man-made, then man can stop famines, and, and actually pretty easily. But I think there is something of concern. As Mark says, we're going backwards. There's something that concerns me that we can have Andrew Natsius say when he was USAID administrator, no famine on my watch, and there was no famine on his watch. What has changed from then to now that allows us suddenly to have four famines on our watch and not be concerned about it and to close our borders to go to the migration issue earlier? Um, and we've talked a lot in this conference today it's about having a sense of moral outrage or perhaps losing our sense of moral outrage buried in our technocratic concerns about fundraising or mandate as a sector. But as a wider populace, why, why, why are we not more outraged about famine in the 21st century? That's the abiding question that I have for myself. And we'll leave that to the next panel. <laughs> <laughs>